Hello and welcome to the Mouthy Money podcast. Uh, I'm really excited today to bring the first edition to our listeners and watchers, because we are now on YouTube as well, um, to a new edition of the of the podcast, uh, where I am joined by my very good colleague, uh, Chris, who has been a guest on the podcast a couple of times, but is now joining me as a co-host of a new format of the show. Chris, hello. Hello. Delighted to join you again, Ed, and looking forward to the new format. Yeah. So we're doing something, um, we're mixing things up. So up until now, the podcast has been primarily about inviting people on to talk about kind of money stories, things relating to financial services, anything kind of like, you know, interesting and noteworthy that we come across from, from people around across the spectrum. But um, I think we felt like there was a little bit of an appetite, I guess, for an, something a little bit more uh, week to week, conversational, what's going on out there in the world sort of story. Um, there's, there's plenty so, happening, right? Loads of change of foot and everything else like that. So it feels like a good time to... <laughs> Mix the Just professional about, and the yeah. personal, yeah. And uh, and we're going to uh, start off with a with a particular kind, so a particular format. Um, so what we're going to do is we are going to talk about what's been happening in the news um, and uh, how that sort of relates to to your to people's money as well and our own money. And I think this is what we kind of want to get into it as well, isn't it? Is is our own a little bit of our own financial lives and how we deal with stuff. Uh, yep. as well uh and and yeah i think that's it in a nutshell um chris before we get stuck in though do you want to just um remind us all uh who you are and where you come from yeah in the words <laughs> What's your name of the where you come from um, yeah uh, <laughs> great uh, silver black <laughs> I, I need to work on that for the next show um yeah <laughs> i as you mentioned i'm christopher Chu. i work at um uh, sister business MRM so we are a PR and communications agency but we specialize in financial services so we are all across all the big finance stories of the day and to make it more relevant to your listeners and to Maldi Money um, my remit is to focus on the consumer side of that so how is the industry communicating to normal men and women and on the street and what are the people worried about and what are the kind of issues that they need to be taking uh, heed of and addressing and pushing out through their sort of communications and the questions they need to be answering. So yeah, it's a topic that I'm really interested in, which is, you know, what's going on in terms of the wider news agenda for obvious reasons, but also how that relates to the personal and um, how that relates to my own situation and my friends and my peers and the readers of Maldi Money and the listeners to this podcast, because ultimately that's, um, that's really important is kind of understanding how what people want to prioritize and what they think about when it comes to their money. So yeah, that's my job in a probably bit too large nutshell. That's all right. Yeah, I mean you've been essentially drafted in as a as a, a foil for me to keep keep me keep, rain rain me in a little bit, um, so I can't just go and rant by myself. Well, mouthy money, mouthy money. You're allowed into, to be mouthy, well, I yeah, think. But mouthy. yeah, we'll see how far we go. If I think you're getting too far, I'll try. Try it. our hardest. <laughs> yeah. So that brings us um, nicely to to what we're going to talk about um, this week. And really, there is only one game in town, isn't there, in terms of what's going on, unfortunately, yep. perhaps would say. And this was all kind of sprung on us. Uh, well, the time the time this pod, pod, podcast will be going out, it'll be over a week. But uh, that's the general election, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. We're all talking about. Mm. Um, yeah, th so what's going I mean, what's going on? A lot of things, I think, um, in terms of the money. Possibly not so much, but it's a funny one, isn't it? There's a few um, conversations that have been happening around pensions. I've, I've seen Rishi's talking about Labour planning a tax raid on on pensions, and you'd expect that yeah. with the Tory voters and their demographic um, for them to kind of highlight yeah. taxation and hitting people at the older end of the spectrum. This is what, yeah, this is what I wrote my column about last week on, mm. on, on Maldi Money is, is the kind of lack of vision from our politicians about pensions. I mean, pen, pensions is it, very easy to get into kind of dull territory here, but it's, it, it's earnest and really important stuff, unfortunately. Mm. And the thing that's kind of really vexed me in the first week of the campaign, and I will, I will caveat this, that, um, I mean, obviously we haven't seen any manifestos yet, so we haven't got any detailed policies or, costings or you know whatever it is that they're going to put out between now and the 4th of July 
but we kind of had we've had a couple of a, a, a actually a couple of pension related announcements so obviously they you know they talk about whether tax general taxation and that kind of thing is going up or down or whatever but the tories started things off by announcing and and i mean this real uh, policy that peels the enamel off your teeth kind of stuff <laughs> the not to be outdone with a trickle lock on the state pension, which is already, I mean, we can have a discussion about, you know, how well off pensioners are and that there's a matter of huge debate, but the triple lock is a very well guarded policy that protects the kind of, you know, the rise every year in the state pension. And the Tories have now announced triple lock plus, I think is what they called it, snappily. Isn't that a quadruple lock? I don't know. I'll find out from you now. The, the, quad, the, the, quad, the quad lock. Yeah. The quad lock. It sounds yeah. like something, something you need for your bike in central London. Or, or, a, ho- or um, a hotel in Berkshire or something. Yeah. Anyway, there we go. The quad lock. Quad lock? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's basically they're going to start raising. And there's, two, and there's a couple of things here that, that, are, that are problematic. They're going to start raising the uh the the basic rate of income tax the income tax allowance which is like 12 and a half something at the moment for state pensioners so that's what the plus bit is so it means that they're not going to get the state pension is never going to get taxed for income tax it's always going to be tax free money basically although in practice it's a lot more complicated than that because people who get incomes from different places and it becomes anyway the really big problem, the problem there for that is a lot of this, there used to be a lot of like stuff in the tax system where different giveaways were given to different groups and that kind of thing. And a lot of that was gotten rid of because it's obviously quite unfair to have, you know, specific benefits for specific kinds of groups of people and this kind of thing. And it's reintroducing that. And it's just kind of like, this is such an obvious sop to your base of voters who you're worried aren't going to vote for you. And it's just politics at its most what's the word i was going to say cynical. transparent but you don't often use that <laughs> cynical yeah but yeah the aims cynical, are clear aren't they yeah. i mean you could have predicted yeah. it if you were playing you know manifesto bingo for the conservative party i think yeah. this one a bit close to the top of the list wouldn't it you, you'd expect them to be trying their best to uh, to get this demographic back on side if they're not already on side uh, yeah. so yeah it's it's so not it's, to be outdone not to be outdone, Labour have have announced something related to pensions as well. And this is weird, isn't it? Because it's like pensions is not the first thing that everybody talks about when it comes to a general election. You know, we're all talking about security or, you know, income tax levels and, you know, like big policy stuff. But actually, they they are talking about pensions, weirdly enough. So Labour have, 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 well, supposedly recommitted to the idea that they're going to um, reverse the abolition of the lifetime allowance. So this is quite a complicated policy. If you bear with me, Chris, for a minute, I will try and explain it. <laughs> we used to have what was called a lifetime allowance on pensions. So you could say mm-hmm. 40,000, I think 60,000 pound a year currently into a pension. And there was a lifetime limit on how much you could put in, which was 1 million pounds and 1 million and 73,000 pounds. I or something like that. And the Tories abolished this over a year ago now basically or they they confer- committed to abolishing it and then it actually went into law this past tax year end so basically now and the reason they did that is there's a specific reason they did that and that's because uh high earners would hit the cap on the pensions and they'd find their being themselves being taxed so heavily after hitting that cap there was no point no incentive for them to keep working which you might say you know, who cares if you're rich, you're rich, but actually it was creating issues and things like the NHS where doctors who were ending up hitting the pensions cap and it led to doctors leaving the NHS and stopping work. And that's not a great incentive when you have a shortage of doctors mm. um, as a basic issue. Yeah. So the, the, the Tories were basically like, okay, let's get rid, let's just get rid of it. Just, you know, get rid of it. It's easy to just get rid of it. Fine. Labour have now said they're going to reverse it. Which is like okay, but this is just so. Why is this like, Ed? We're only a few days sorry. in, and I can sense your exhaustion sorry, and, yeah. and this campaign is really. I'm so tired. It's been a long week. <laughs> um, the, th- the thing that the thing that I don't like, right? And I wrote that in the comment. The thing that I don't like is that is that is that pensions is such a long term thing. It's something that's supposed. To, yeah, we're supposed to engage with over the course of forty years of well working lives, and then probably the next. 30 years of retirement or whatever it is, you know, people spend in retirement. 
and we're just chopping and changing and it's all over the place. And then, uh, you know, yeah, the I think said, a wider point here. Oh, we're going to bring it well back, but we're going to have you know, a carve out around. for doctors. Although six months ago they uh, had admitted, the they you know, actually having are... a carve out is 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 really hard. And that going, it just, yeah, it's frustrating, isn't it? Um, yeah, no, and I think that, that that is one of the things with policy generally when it comes to to sort of governments anyway, you know, obviously the election cycle, I suppose, doesn't help because they have a shorter time horizon because the, the, the purpose doesn't appear to be doing what's best for the country, but it's about getting re-elected, which is an ending of itself. But that does lead to this short-termist thinking across most policy areas. And particularly, you know, an easy win is to tweak something to make someone feel better off in the short term rather than doing the, the, the hard work to reform an area of financial services to, to make it better for people in the long term. And there isn't just enough of that long term thinking around it, I think. So I share your frustration. It's like, well, one step forward, two steps back seems to be the order of the day when it comes to reforming these things. Um, so, yeah, we'll wait and see. I mean, I, re I remain sort of there are better p people, people better placed, I suppose, to talk about the, the fair, relative mer merits of the triple lock and the um, and uh, the lifetime allowance. But like you said, I think I'd rather see some kind of cross-party consensus, actually, considering they're so close on so many other issues as well about what's better for the long term, for what is an aging population facing a care crisis potentially in the future and people wondering how they're going to be able to, whether the state pension will even exist in the future and how we get people to incentivize to save over the long term. And there's been good steps in that with auto enrollment and other things, but actually, yeah. It, 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 no wonder there's a big sigh when it's like we're going back to what we did previously if there's no kind of real thinking about it because it just feels like wasted time and wasted energy in one direction or the other depending yeah on absolutely mm. so i think we're gonna we'll, get, we'll do a bit more of a kind of running commentary of what's going on with the general election I, I feel like this is not a topic that we're going to be avoiding much in the next few weeks um mm. or it's not going to be possible to avoid so i think we'll see what else comes up i mean i'm probably going to dig into the manifestos um, and actually have a look at, you know, what's going on. I think that would be interesting because, you know, actual proper policy on paper, particularly from, well, I think actually, I mean, t t tell, tell me if you disagree, but the, the, I think the, the Labour Party have been somewhat vague with some of their policies. Yeah, intentionally. And again, um, I'm not a political strategist, but I do think mm, their sort of policy has been let's let the Conservatives continue to cock it up on a grand scale, and then we just seem by default the better option. But we are reaching yeah. a stage now where you launch your manifesto four weeks out from a snap election. We need to hear what the details are. Um, yeah. I was, you know, complaining to, to my colleagues in the office this week about just that. You know, what what is what is the plan then? I mean, they've hinted at a few things, of course, but we want to start getting into the detail. And I know you do, Ed. I think you like better than being buried in a financial policy and picking the the bones out of it. So I think. Yeah, I think if you, I mean, I read, I did read recently somewhere that if you look at back at like other successful, so particularly on the side of Labour, I mean, we're not, we're not going to have a politics podcast here, but I'll make a comment on it. Um, Tony Blair did something similar, I think, in '97, which was basically just don't talk about too much, just let the mm -hmm. let the, uh, the the Tories, you know, basically ruin it for themselves and and we will have a you know pro government and just talk about one or two things kind of thing and it's it, you know fair enough it works um but yeah seems to be see. yeah it definitely let's does seem like they're trying to next. quell sort of any kind of controversial commentary from anyone in if you look at mm. you know the the ferrari around diane abbott and others um uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why Rishi's so keen to do the debates because he needs to turn the table over, right? So he's hoping for yeah. a major clangor to be dropped on those. Uh, so I don't think we'll be seeing anything but a grey burr from uh, from Kier on those either. So yeah, be interesting to see how it all pans out. I think one of the, they obviously have been speaking to business though, big business, because I don't know if you saw the the piece in the Times this this week. The 120 of the UK's business leaders have have signed an open letter. This is across sort of industries and including our very own sort of financial services saying, and I quote, a new outlook is needed so the UK can break free from a decade of economic stagnation, um, which is a major step, I think. Uh, you know, 120 business leaders signing on that from, from across the kind of business world. And obviously the Tories are traditionally seen as the party of big business and the ones who, who, who are getting it right on the economy. But that's sort of almost from the horse's mouth there with 120 influential voices saying that hasn't been the case and it's time for a change. So there are clearly conversations of reassurance that have been given to those people that Labour has a plan and it's a better plan than the one we have, one we have at the moment. Um, like you, I look forward to seeing the detail of what that looks like when, when the manifestos are, 
are introduced. But it did get me thinking about this sort of 10 years of stagnation and what that means for sort of personal finances. And I don't know about you, and uh, this this is probably probably something that goes back to sort of how I was how I was raised or whatever. But um, I'm a bit of a pessimist when it comes to money. Um, so my thing is to try and think carefully about um, what's going to happen in the next six months. And there's a, a, every client that I've worked with who deals with savings and investments always says you need to have enough money set aside for a rainy day. And that looks like sort of six months worth of, of, of savings. And I, I'm lucky enough to, 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 to do that. But I did have a conversation uh, with, my, with my wife uh, this week and it was, it was about, well, how much is that now? With everything that's kind of gone on with inflation crisis, which has obviously sparked this discussion around whether or not the Tories are right on the economy, I suppose. That's been the big thing, the cost of living and how much of that's in their control is another conversation. But um, and we, you know, I had a figure in my mind, which was higher than hers. <laughs> I think she's more interested in, in, in stimulating the economy with a bit of spending, frankly. And so we kind of went through and worked out what we could do with our personal finances if for example, something terrible were to happen and there were, you know, I were to lose my job and she were to lose her job, how long would we be able to last based on what we've got? Um, and it was a really interesting conversation. What constitutes a essential, what doesn't, you know, if I haven't got a job, I'm going to be at home a lot. So I'm going to be wanting to watch a lot of, you know, subscription sport on TV. Whereas, uh, obviously my wife didn't agree that that was, that was one, for example, that needed to be taken care of. She'd want to continue shopping at a particular brand of supermarket. I'd not, I'd quite, quite willing to make some savings there. So it was, it was quite an interesting conversation, but it did bring up an interesting sort of idea about how much we, you need to put aside and then thinking about where that money's best placed and uh, how much needs to be in cash and how much you should be investing. And um, I'm probably too much on the cash side of things. And I found myself a good rate with a bank called Synergy. Uh, they're offering sort of close to market leading uh, uh, above 5%, which, you know, considering inflation dropped markedly is suddenly starting to look a bit more attractive and I'm not losing money in real terms. But then um, there are sort of these services like Flagstone who offer the ability to switch between accounts in real time and find the best rate. And actually, that's something I probably should look at if I'm wanting to maximize that as well as sort of where do I save money and worrying about the worst where can I kind of, kind of maximize it and then the other thing is investing so I've got my my major well I'll say them Hargreaves Lansdowne app where I have my stocks and shares ISA and I actually although I invest in a SIP there regularly um, I've been put off putting money into that just watching and I know it's over the long term right so with my SIP it's quite easy you tie the money up and you don't worry about it for 30 odd years and you ride ride the waves out but actually if I might need to get my hands on that money and 18 months, two years time, you know, just watching the markets ahead of the latest inflation comment was a really interesting thing for me because they surged expecting inflation to come in under expectation and a rate cut to follow hot on the heels of that. And what you actually ended up with was this sort of in between place where it was in the right direction, but not far enough. And so all these kind of gains that the FTSE in particular had seen record highs were being hit. And that was great. Suddenly you're seeing a, a retrenchment this week as that sentiment kind of recedes. And, I know that's how markets work fundamentally. I'm not naive, but also just from a sort of consumer point of view, you think, well, long-term money, fine. Mid-term money, no. And short-term money is not suitable for that. So yeah, it's quite interesting kind of maybe logging into my app every day is a bad idea. Maybe I should just do it at the end of the month. I don't know. What would you advise, Ed? What's your take as uh, Ed is a mouthy money? Well, uh, it's not um, advice, obviously. It's not, not advice. That was going to be my first thing. <laughs> not an advisor. My tips. So a rainy day fund, I think obviously it's important to have one. I mean, I, I would admit we're not good at having a rainy day fund. We've more got like a rainy rainy day credit card ready to go, basically. Which is just <laughs> terrible. <laughs> but that I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna claim claim here that, that I've had I had I've had to buy a house and have a wedding and then we've had a baby and all that kind of stuff. And that'll it's do just, it. That'll but, do it, Ed. That'll make yeah. a bit of a dent. Well then I did also I did also decide to go climb climb a mountain in Africa, which probably wasn't the cheapest decision of my year last year, but that's not But a good that. life decision, um, right? Enjoyable. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um the rainy day fund thing is I always say to people is just obviously figure out the level you want and that's individuals for everybody in you know, there's all the rules of thumb of, you know, three months worth of expenses or six months worth of expenses, or whatever. You have to find your kind of natural rate on that. But then I always say, don't just have that. Once you've done that, don't just leave it and forget it, right? Because in 20 years time, if you haven't increased that fund, 
in, inflation alone is going to have meant that you that's not going to be enough money if it were to happen to you in five or ten years time or whatever that you need it um so always make sure you're adding more to it so say you know you say you finish your fund and it's i don't know five grand and then in a year inflation has been two percent so what's two percent of five grand add that on and that's kind of you know trying to cover off you know more expenses in next year than they would be this year i think so make sure you're always adding to it a little bit yeah yeah you've got to keep it in cash you can't put it in investments like you say because Stuff goes up and down all the time. So just investing that money is just not good because uh, you're just going to cause trouble by, by by having to pull it out of an investment at the wrong time. Um, but on the investment thing, it's like, just don't look at it. Just don't, just leave it alone. Yeah. Like, have, have convictions in what you've invested in and just forget about it. Look at it once a year kind of thing to make sure nothing's gone chaotically wrong. Uh, I mean, I, I, have a, I have a sip I look at very occasionally. I, I, my sip is really annoying because I, I had like three different pension pots and I decided to consolidate them all into one pot and put it in a sip. Mm, so I did something really similar actually. Yeah. And I did it at the absolute worst time possible because <laughs> it, the put well, for, for silly reasons, because it, so these pots had obviously, it was like three different pots that I'd accrued from different jobs over the years. And those had obviously started a base of zero and had grown over time, blah, blah, blah. But when you moved it, I moved it across to consolidate it with, I got it with AJ Bell. Uh, I did it in February, 2020. So that money went in like par. And then the, then with the pandemic hit and the markets <laughs> went to the absolute tubes and my on paper losses were absolutely massive. And ever since then, in, in, in sheer like uh, number terms from starting day zero, February, 2020, my, my pension's still in some absolutely horrible deficit, even though in real terms, looking back over like six or seven years more worth of kind of, you know, pension contributions, et cetera, it's, I'm still miles ahead, mm. but I've kind of like live with the, with the weird timing of, of having consolidated right before the pandemic made markets absolutely blow up. Mm. Um, so I look at it and I, it still says it's like minus, you know, 7% or something like that. But in actual fact, it's not, which is a, a slightly clunky illustration for the fact that don't like, just don't try not to worry about it. Leave it for a long time, you know, just, just let it, just let it do what it yeah. needs to do. That's why no, you're I, supposed I, to I have the two that. different things. I do hear you on that. And I've got, I've got, I've got a JISA for my daughter uh, with, with Scottish friendly and we do the same thing where it's, you know, that's 18 year horizon. I'm relaxed about that. And, you know, putting in a bit little and often you'll leave, you'll, you'll ease out the, the ups and the downs and make that work, you know, so I'm fine with that, but it's this kind of midterm thing. And, um, how much is fun money and how much is, you know, or speculation money, fund money is probably not the right term, but you know, how much can you put subject to the waves of, of the stock market? And at the moment I'm really unwilling. And I think that speaks to what we were saying before about this idea of economic stagnation and, Actually, it's, I'm in a kind of, I need to keep hold of what I've got here. And particularly with, and this is the other thing I think that's big in in, in a lot of people's minds is that I'm remortgaging imminently, you know? And if you, I spoke to friends 18 months ago, oh, it'll, be, it'll be falling by then. And just in the back of my mind, I'm like, it won't. <laughs> and there's a little yeah. voice in my head. There was no sort of real justification for that because I expected it in a rational level for it to have fallen by now though as well. But you always hope for the best plan for the worst and, uh, you know, part of that rainy day fund is, is absorbing some of the costs of the new two-year fix. Well, my in my in my, in my attempt to, to stay down with the kids, do you know what, because um, I'm not a Gen Z, I'm firmly in the middle of the millennials, do you know what Gen Z is call call rainy day funds? And I'm going to try and I'm going to try and uh, they, they've had like a rebrand. I I think like this as a co- I'm, as I'm a comms person. Loop, yeah. I'm only just a millennial, so uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm completely. So, so Gen Z re- have rebranded rainy day funds because rainy day funds boring. It's what your granny does when she her car breaks her yeah, like, you know, calm down. Seventy five four patina breaks down. <laughs> <laughs> um. So Gen Z, and I'm going to try and say this in a family friendly way because I don't want I don't want to have the cursing um warning on our, on our yeah, if, yeah if you're if the kids are in the car you may want to yeah. skip the 15 <clears> seconds <throat> no so they gen z call it an f-off fund let's call it right okay 
Is that, is, that a thumb, is that a finger up to the people making them make a, a, an F off fund or is that something else? I don't know. I, don't, I mean, I, the, thing is, the thing is, is, is if I were to start an F off fund, my, my, my wife might, might ask me if I'm, pl- if I'm planning on leaving her or something. Because <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, no, I'm out of here. See you later. See you guys there. I've got, I've got, my, I've got my money. You know, Just I'm, don't ever I'm, pack I'm, a random hold off because then that will start yeah, questions. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm no. going, I'm going to buy, I'm going to Bali and I'm going to start a beads business or something like that. You know, the world needs, needs more beads businesses. There's no yeah, doubt about I'm just it. Getting, I'm getting out of here. Basically. I find the, I just, I find the framing really interesting and I quite like it. Cause it's just like, you know, rainy day fund is like, I mean, I've got a mortgage. I have to sit here like, in the yeah. weather. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, like, yeah, no, it's tight. It's like, it's like preppers, isn't it? It's like bug out bag. I'm out of here, guys. I've got my axe and my and my solar panels or whatever. Like, I'm done. <laughs> my tin food. I'm out of here. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah, there's, some, there's something in that actually. It's quite interesting. Yeah, the mindset of it. Because again, I'm firmly like, well, I've got to sit in the rain, haven't I? Whereas actually, no, one, you know, put a few bit of money aside and go off some to sunny uplands for a while, and then come back when when the coast is clear, kind of thing. That obviously mm. helps if you don't have a mortgage or kids like we do, Ed. We're a little bit yeah. more. But, you know, it, it does maybe show a difference in the attitudes to that. And actually, um, a more of a global mindset around these things as well, you know, about, you know, digital nomads and things like that might might make that a bit more bit more accessible for people as well. So it's like, well, if it's not working for me here, then what, I can make it work somewhere else, which, you know, is kind yeah. of vaguely encouraging, I suppose. Yeah. You see a lot of like rationalization between generations, right? And how different generations behave and like millennials being a millennial, I'm interested in how people rationalize how millennials behave. And we were all kind of like coming age around the financial crisis and we were all trying to kind of hold on to careers that weren't really doing ever really doing the thing for us and all this kind of stuff. And we're clinging on to what our parents had and haven't really had that pan out. Mm. Whereas the Gen Zers have kind of like, no, you know what? We're not playing this game, basically. And they're all about the grind and the hustle and being self-employed and not committing to careers and quiet quitting and all this kind of thing. It's all very interesting sort of trends, I think. There's definitely yeah. stuff to tap into there. No doubt. Um, no doubt. And as you know, for financial services companies as well, it's how do you how do you market to someone with that attitude? How you might have to change, hmm. you know, rainy day funds and, put, you know, put money aside into this savings account because you might need it one day. It's different marketing completely or PR to F off, <laughs> which, which is completely different energy, right? But, yeah. uh, one Maybe not FCA of, compliant either. I mean, it might not be, yeah, but there, I'm sure we can find a way around the, the wording. But, you know, th- there is there is something in that, I think, yeah, people's attitudes shifting and changing. Mm. But 10 years of economic stagnation might have a similar impact on the next group coming through. We'll see. We'll be a bit old wow. when we're doing this. If we're if still doing mind. this in 20 years' time, Ed. If you want my cynical macro take, take it's all just a question of interest rates ultimately anyway. So now we've got higher interest rates, they're probably all going to be better off. Oh, there so, we go. Yeah, I think, uh, well, let's not get bogged down in political economy. Um, I was going to say, should we, uh, we you need to worry what the Bank of England are doing and not what Labour or the Conservatives are up to. That's basically what you're saying. Yeah, perhaps. <laughs> Basically, yeah, it's all just—it's all just a matter of interest rates. Ultimately, no, it doesn't. Nothing else matters. It's whatever Andrew Bailey says. He's in charge, really. He's the—he's he's our real leader. <laughs> so, yeah, he's the wizard of Oz, power behind the throne. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Chris, we've uh, we've whittled on here. Um, let's uh, let's wrap it up. We're going to do this once a week, uh, but it's been good fun for the first one. I hope people have enjoyed listening. So. Chris, thank you very much for joining me. My pleasure, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. And yeah, we'll see see what next week brings. Maybe the manifestos might drop. Oh yeah, hopefully. Yeah, fingers crossed. All right, thanks for listening, everybody. Obviously, you can catch us on Apple, uh, Spotify, or YouTube. Um, and do sign up to the newsletter from the Money website to get all the latest updates. Uh, so thank you and goodbye. <laughs>